you know dogs put one right in front of it, right in the middle of the highway interchange. They just did it. Who'd you, probably in there. Who'd you make mad? Who, me? Yeah. Because I'm not send that. You know, I'm the so you don't have time to read it. I like to. Uh, there we go. There we go. I like Brian, that's going to be a quiz. <laughs> oh, boy, at the end or the beginning? <laughs> <laughs> this guy. Okay, 20 seconds, guys. <laughs> Okay, six o'clock has arrived. Scott, if you would please call roll. Marvin Cusick? Here. Cole Ring? Here. Walker Henson? Michael O'Brien? Here. David Trojan? Here. Brian Henry? Here. Greg Hobb? Here. Donald Roberts? Here. Clarence Maley? Here. And Scott Orr? Here. That sounds like we have a quorum. I hereby call the April uh, April 15th meeting of the Metropolitan Area Planning Commission to order. First item on the agenda uh, was the roll call. Second item on the agenda is the minutes. If you've all had a chance to take a look at the minutes, I will approve or I will uh, entertain a motion. Motion to approve. Second. Motion and second to approve. All those in favor, aye. Aye. Those opposed? And that motion carries. Uh, the next item on the agenda, item three, is use by review. Hold a public hearing and consider action on a use by review application submitted by Onsite Ready Mix, Enid LLC, and Oklahoma Business Land Holdings LLC, requesting to utilize the property at 1620 North 54th Street, zoned I-3 Industrial Heavy, district as a portable concrete plant. Good evening, gentlemen. We are reviewing. Um, it is for a <clears throat> cement plant permanent, but they are requesting that it's temporary more so. Uh, what we are looking at in this area here, if you can see, if I can remember how to get this one. This is where they're proposing it. It is just north of O&K Garrett off of 54th. It is surrounded by agriculture on the east side. Um, industrial two, and then heavy industrial to the north. What we're looking at is that we are using, because this is a cement plant in an I-3, it does need to become approved by the MAPC and then approved by the uh, city commission. A use by review is not required. It is just the vehicle that we are using to convey the information. But what we do have is if you'll this is pretty much saying that the I-3 here, why we have the I-3, these are these cannot be used. And then it comes down here to say that a cement, lime, gypsum, plaster, or Paris manufacture. Those all have to be approved by you, recommended by you to be approved by the council. Um, the uh, representative of the owner is here, Joseph. And that is about all I have, unless you have questions. I have one question of Joseph. A dust suppression, how do you handle that? Uh, we, we are just going to have water sprinklers on site. Get them up there. We'll have water sprinklers on site um, for every pile of rock that we have, and then we have a sprinkler set up over the plant itself. We'll have. They're not in place today, but they will be before we ever operate. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, Scott, I just want to make sure I heard you right. You said that this is a buy right use. It's just you're using this as a vehicle to get. It's not buy right. It just the, the verbiage in the ordinance isn't clear on the vehicle we have to use. Understood. But okay. because we all understand what a use by review is, that's the, that's what we chose. Okay, that's clear. Thank right you. There in that blue section, Brian, it says uh, that it has to be studied by the planning commission and then. Uh, have the express approval of the Board of City okay. Commissioners. So okay, we see. don't really have an item for a studying, right. but you guys need to give us your... Uh, one question to the Chair. When we, if we make the motion to approve, do we need to do it conditional with the materials at the bottom? Is that correct? If I would say yes. 
What does the materials at the bottom? You mean that the, the things were lime, the, gypsum, the, and the site would be watered to minimize the dust. Correct. I, I guess I should have asked legal, not the chair. No, I just. I can't read it. Specifically, it's it's just, I can use those slides. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it won't be outside of those. Any other questions? <clears throat> I will entertain a motion. Make a motion to approve with the amendment of for watering the dust. And the list of materials at the bottom of that blue section. Okay. I'll second it. Motion and second with uh, an amendment uh, to follow the instructions on the sheet, uh, which is to uh, maintain the dust. And uh, what was the second part of that? The materials at the bottom. The of materials, that. okay. All those in favor, aye. Aye. Those opposed? And that motion is unanimous. Thank you. Next item, item four, administration. Presentation and discussion on um, affordable housing opportunities. All right, as you might have noticed, I am not Leroy Alsop. He's, a, <laughs> he's, a, he's, a, he's a, not gonna be here today, but I thought I'd go through this presentation that he made uh, before the city uh, mayor and commissioners. And I, there's a lot of information in your packet. I'm not gonna read every slide to you, but I wanna just give you the idea of what we're talking about. And, and uh, hopefully you can give us some direction and feedback on some options that you'd like to see. But it's the idea of how can we get affordable housing into Enid. Well, most of the houses that are currently being built are in the $400,000 range. And for a lot of people, that's just not affordable. Uh, trying to find something for a, for a, you know, if we have an industrial plant that's success, successful in coming here, trying to uh, provide housing for workers that we might need is, is a challenge we're trying to meet. So we've had several requests looking at, you know, what are some things we can do t to get people excited about um, doing some infill development in certain parts of Enid? And uh, the ideas have been brought forth about perhaps uh, manufactured housing. So we're gonna take a look about, a look at modular homes, discuss the differences between them, uh, manufactured homes and stick built homes. We're gonna go through uh, some of the differences in, in code, cost comparisons, safety, and uh, some alternative ideas. And then we'll, I think we'll probably talk very briefly about ADUs or accessory dwelling units, like a mother-in-law plan, something like that. Those are gaining some popularity in other communities as well. So um, what is a mobile or manufactured home? There's the full definition there, but essentially in our ordinance, if it's on a chassis, it's a manufactured home. So it doesn't matter what standard that it might be built to, if it's on a chassis, it's a manufactured home. Uh, mobile homes, typically, when we think of those, those are structures built before 1976. Uh, manufactured homes that are built today have a much more stringent standard than the ones built before 1976. They have to comply with HUD codes. There's some uh, examples there. A manufactured home pretty much is on a permanent chassis like we talked about. A modular is lacking a chassis, is, but it's transported in different sections. Um, it is constructed to meet the IRC, and modular homes are allowed pretty well in any zoning unless you have a covenant that restricts it. That restricts it. Uh, there's only a few places where you can have a, a true manufactured home in Enid. There's R3 zoning and R6 zoning. R3 is individual lots. R6 is a mobile home park. So those are the two places that you can really have it. You can have one in ag, but we didn't really list that because you have to have at least 80 acres according to our ordinance to do that. So that's where you can have it. A lot of the studies are trying to figure out, you know, where, how can you increase the availability of these lots or the availability of people to own their own home and have their own lot where they don't have to pay rent. So we'll look into some of those options later. Um, this, just, this slide just kind of goes into modular versus stick built homes and it talks about our 2015 international residential code. It doesn't apply to manufactured homes. They, they all have to comply with the HUD standard. Um, this talks about that we really can't make 
Um, we can't make manufactured homeowners comply with the IRC. They, they're, uh, they're under the HUD code, the federal code. Surprisingly though, if you go to some of these builders and you tell them and ask them to build your manufactured home using uh, IRC standards, they will do it for a price. So it is, it is an option. Um, cost comparisons, there's some different ideas on what manufactured homes could cost, 50 to $160 a square foot, modular 90 to 120, and I don't know if anyone's priced stick built homes lately, but you know, these, these values vary widely depending on what you want. A custom home, you know, these, these days may, may be more than $200 a square foot. Uh, a lot of the $400,000 homes are 2,000 square feet or so. Those are some more about the costs of them. Locations, we talked briefly about this. These are the places that manufactured homes can be, mobile home parks or R3 neighborhoods. And the differences between them, like I said, you know, the R3 provides someone an opportunity to own their own lot, own their own home. In R6, you're gonna be paying rent to someone to have your house there or just be living in a rental. This, these are some locations on where R3 zoning is throughout Enid. You can see, you can see there where they are in relation to the 74 square miles that we have. And these are these are little close-ups. You can you can look on several of these close-ups. You can see what what zoning is close to R3, and we'll we'll get into we'll get into that as an alternative towards the end of the presentation. There's one by South Leona Mitchell and on East Randolph, R3 zoned. There tends to be a lot of R4 right next to R3, which is duplex zoned property. And these are the locations of the R6 mobile home park districts. Several up north. The one out west is Trails West, down there across from the skating rink. These are those some little close-ups of where R6 is located. So this is really what we want to talk about in this presentation are what are some of the alternatives to maybe expand manufactured housing opportunities in Enid. Some things to consider are, and I like how Leroy put it in the, in the meeting a few weeks ago. He said, you know, maybe we start small. We don't bite off too big of a chunk all at once, but some options to consider are to rezone and expand the R3 district. Uh, the second option would be to create an overlay district where we can allow some manufactured homes to be so we can have a target area and, and maybe try out a smaller portion where we'd be okay with that. Another option would be maybe a use by review within an R4 district. So here are some different places in the pink where R4 is scattered throughout Enid. They're already set up for duplexes, but perhaps it could be a use by review for manufactured homes. If I'm going too fast, someone slow me down, but I figure if you have questions, you can ask them at any time. So right there circled is where some current, uh, I think that's R3 is, and everything in the yellow highlighted area is R4. So we're looking at, those might be some potential target areas where we could consider either an overlay district or maybe a use by review. So that's one idea is to expand R3. That's breaking down all of the code that we have on R3. The other one is to create an overlay district where you can set physical boundaries and say, okay, well, this physical area, we're going to allow manufactured homes uh, either by right or you could have an overlay and have it go through use by review if you'd like that. So that's an option. Yeah. 
So there are some design elements, interestingly enough, uh, with that we've discussed about manufactured homes. I think a lot for a lot of people when we think about it, we have the idea of this old trailer in the 70s in our mind, you know, when we think of manufactured homes. But there's some really nice examples of homes that are out there. They, they look a lot different than they used to in the 1970s. Um, and there's, there's an idea that we could, we could maybe, um, you can see there, there's maybe we, we require a certain width for these houses to be, or we require them to try to match a certain amount of 50% of what's on the street. Maybe we require a certain shingle or a pitch of roof. That's what Oklahoma City's done in their ordinance, but we're, we're trying to review the legality of that because there's been some changes that we haven't had time to research. We're working on uh, uh, making them change. We, you can't make them change whether or not they comply with HUD, but uh, on the, as far as the aesthetics, there might be some things we could control if we consider this. There was a 2020 law that limits de, uh, municipalities creating new building design elements. And we'll have to, but the <coughs> bill was written a little <coughs> oddly. So it's a little hard to tell what you can and can't do. But that's on the next page, I think. Yeah, there's a. There's a lot of, I've seen several pictures and examples in Claremore and Oklahoma City with, of manufactured homes that look very nice. Garage doors, porches, you know, they don't look like you're, they don't look like a trailer. They look, they're nice. Um, and there was a comment made at the last meeting. There's, there, there are some sections in Enid where the current housing that's there, a new manufactured home would be an improvement. Uh, based on the housing that's around it. So those are some of the things that we're considering. I don't know if you have any questions or comments or if you have any thoughts about if you like an overlay district, if you like use by review in a different zoning. Um, but we're definitely going to be studying it and we're going to take it back to you guys before we bring it back to the mayor and commissioners for any, any type of ordinance change or zoning uh, considerations. So I'd make a couple of comments just based on observation of this zoning um, in regard to doing new overlays that's fine but we already have some areas that are zoned for mobile homes but those areas have some issues first of all you've got the midway edition um, that would be the the photograph that has Willow, Oxford, and Washington Street. Um, part of the problem there is we don't have fire hydrant flow. We don't have enough pressure to allow for new construction in a lot of cases. And so that might be something that down the road, not today or tomorrow, of course, but that may be something the city council needs to look at. Hey, here's a huge swath I mean, there's, there's a lot of lots there. This may be one of those future projects where we need to look at improving the water and sewer infrastructure. Um, Jason's over there going, yeah, I need another project. Thanks. But um, you could open up. I can't even put up a storage building in this. I cannot stick build an 8 by 8 storage building here because in some <coughs> cases, the, the water pressure at the hydrant is so low, you can't get a building permit. And, and so to talk about having new districts, that's great, but we've already got some infrastructure. It just need, it's old, it's old. It's like a lot of parts of Enid, it's old. We've done a good job upgrading a lot of our infrastructure. I think we need to continue that in this. And if this is something that's near and dear to the hearts of the of the administration and the citizens, and perhaps we need to look at some of these areas that are older, that are already zoned, that we look at potentially going in and working on some of those. That might be a project, the next or the next project in regard to utility infrastructure. Also, there's a couple of areas <clears throat> in that neighborhood, and then of course we have this area south uh, south of France, in between Independence and Leona Mitchell. Unfortunately, a lot of that 
is in floodplain, and there's just nothing we can do about that. You could, if you narrowed up the lot requirements, you might be able to gain 10 or 15 lots here and there. That's something to consider. Um, again, it's just something to, to consider. Um, unfortunately, even our opportunity zones in Enid, Oklahoma, I don't know who came up with that map, but unfortunately all of our opportunity zones in Enid, Oklahoma are either on a railroad track, uh, under a grain elevator, or in a floodplain. There's a reason why no one lives in those areas. So I think that's something I'd like to see studies as we can go ahead and improve what we've already got because there's a lot of lots there and it's very cost prohibitive for any developer to go out and buy 10, 20, 30 acres and put in the correct water, sewer, road. That's why a lot of these houses are three and 400,000 because the lots are 30 and 40, 50,000 and can't afford to do that type of work for a smaller mobile home for a less expensive alternative affordable housing route. It'd be great if there was an, a less expensive route to do that and I think infill is probably the target for that. So that's my two cents. This particular area that you were looking at, um, we've recently done just that. We've yeah. recently extended brand new water main into that area. We have a good track record, of track record of listening to people and making improvements on that. A lot of the lots in this particular area around Leona Mitchell, some of them are, I believe, are only 25 foot wide yeah. lots. I mean, you have to add three, four lots together to have enough to build something right. on. Um, but there certainly are a lot of vacant lots that could be developed. <clears throat> Scott, I appreciate you looking at Oklahoma City. Any other peer communities similar in size, the 50 to 100,000 population like Enid in this region that have adopted a, a zoning process that will allow for these types of projects? There, there's ideas popping up all over the place. We're going to get into the accessory dwelling units. I know Norman and has just recently been working on that. So has Oklahoma City. Uh, I think that Claremore's done something different with their, with their manufactured homes. A lot of really small communities just allow them by right, you know, the really small communities. But uh, if you have a code and you have more stringent zoning, then, you know, it's not for, it's not for everywhere. Uh, and in some neighborhoods, you're going to have um, covenants and restrictions regardless. And so that, that's a whole, nother, a whole nother can of worms there. So Yeah. So a <clears throat> couple things that, that I, well, I guess questions, comments, I don't really know which way to designate them. Um, has the city looked into the International Code Council's off-site construction manuals that address these things? I have not. You have not? I would encourage you to do so. Um, it, it talks about installation methods and all that good stuff that you guys would need probably to consider. And it actually would make it a lot easier on your, on your code department because it, some of this, if you adopt those manuals, it allows for uh, video inspection while it's still in the factory so that you guys can save some you know, time going on site. Um, and you'll be able to look at aspects again while it's still in there because some of these are now I know this headache all too well from dealing with it in Perry. <laughs> mm -hmm. And some of them are being built like pods in the factory and then inserted into the house later. And it can be a nightmare for guys like me and you. Um, the other end that I, I didn't hear brought up in this, um, have you guys considered special use or conditional use permits? Yeah, I, 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 uh, I was thinking about use by review perhaps where maybe you guys could take it on a case-by-case -case basis as an option. Sure. They're essentially the same yeah. thing. It's just when you adopt them that way, you guys can lay out the criteria that allows for some considerations to be made as far as, well, you use your imagination, whatever that is that the city draws up. Um, like, I know the statute that you guys are talking about, and yes, it's a nightmare. Yes, it's vague. I don't think anybody has a real clear-cut answer on it. Uh, the only thing that we've gotten was... Somebody went overboard with design criteria, and now we're all getting our hands slapped for it. Um, 
So the only other question, or I guess comment that I had outside of the specific use part, um, because it has very specific requirements in that statute, and so I'm in favor more so, and I don't, of the overlay district portion of it, just because of the way that that all reads out. Um, the way that they look at that was they were taking broad swaths of towns. Again, I, I want to be careful with my wording on that, but somebody got overboard, and so now everybody's kind of having to pitch in, but that way it allows you to not get overboard with these more affordable types, but you can use some common sense regulation on the design criteria for this. Absolutely. You know, one of the things we would consider also, Brian, would be we would want these to be secured to a permanent foundation. Yeah. Uh, so that you, you know people aren't looking at a chassis and they're not looking at some skirting, you know So it really helps it to look like a normal home. I uh, say normal, but like a stick-built home The only other one and I know you're about to get into them uh, Just a town to keep that has figured it out Edmund for these ADUs because we're looking at the same thing right now um, I, I would encourage you to go talk to them as well Real quick are there it's kind of thinking away from this discussion at all but does the city have resources if a walkomas or a garber or a drummond was looking at an area if they had some property maybe even had somebody that was wanting to develop is the city willing to assist them with whether it's engineering or schematics or have we for the for the good of the region rather than or can the city even do that you know we we want to be good partners but we don't want to reinvent the wheel where we don't need to yeah and uh there's some there's some organizations out there like anoda that works really well with small communities and uh and there's there are programs specifically designed for smaller towns and helping them to to get this type of housing in their community okay. Um, so there are some resources that are already out there that can probably be a better resource than us. But of course, if we have questions that come through our office, we're going to try to be, we're going to try to answer them the best we can and, and at least point them to the right resources so that they can get help. Because we're all trying to do the same thing. We're, all, we're trying to figure out how can we get some new housing built where people can afford it. Okay. Kind of the same thing that he mentioned. It just slipped my mind entirely. Um, I can't remember the, the name of the town in Oregon that did this for their for their town, but again, the ADUs is where we're headed. So, uh, what they did was they had two design, two I guess pre-approved designs that are available on their website. Okay, you're shaking. So I assume you've already looked at it. I haven't looked. I know what you're talking. Okay, and so basically, if you pick these two designs, you just submit your permit application. It's already approved. It's a painless process, and you go. You want to get you know crazy with the redesign. So I mean, kind of getting into what you said, I mean, then other municipalities in the area could kind of piggyback on what we're doing here. Just mm -hmm. a thought. Are we ready to talk about ADUs for just a minute? Scott, I have one quick question. Okay. The, on the, whether we're, you know, you go to manufactured modular is on the chassis. Is, is, can the chassis, is the chassis specific to steel? Can it, it's just chassis wood? It's our, primarily steel. Our ordinance just says if it's on a chassis, it's a manufactured home. It doesn't even get into any of the construction of how that chassis is built. Well, and then there's also another point where where you have a manufactured home that's that's on a chassis that now gets a title and it's assigned a, a vehicle identification number, and now you get to deal with uh, motor and vehicle parts that, commission. And that's where I was kind of going because the tax when, I, when I think of a VIN number, I'm thinking of a steel chassis. Right. But like like our firm out east of town here, that I believe that's all like two by twelves with bridging and everything. So that that is not a VIN number. So by definition, is that a is that a? I'll help you with that one, Michael. Yeah, help me. So Petra Construction out east of town. Yep. You see those houses? Right. Those are actually stick built homes. They're not built on a chassis. Okay. He, he does get those loaded up on a truck and he puts them on a permanent permanent yep. foundation. So they are built according to code. And it's not on a chassis, so according to our ordinance, that's a stick-built home. Okay, so that doesn't apply t for any of the terms that are listed in the in the document here. That's stick-built. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Scott, another question: What what edition are you guys in on the current residential cycle? 2015. I th we're getting we're about to do the 2018 update. Okay, so the 18 actually defines what he just said. Uh, it gets more into. Um, 
you, you just have to trust me on that because it has a whole section on manufactured homes that you would have to look into. I just don't have that committed to memory. Okay, if everyone doesn't know what an accessory dwelling unit is, think mother-in-law plan, you know, apartment flat. Uh, Something that I that I think is interesting, the the two communities that have recently you know just are studying this and have passed things. What one of them has a a maximum square footage of about six seventy five, and the other one's seven fifty. So we're not talking about a, a big two bedroom house that you just have in your backyard. We're, these are like efficiency, you know, studio one person, you know, accessory dwelling unit. So. We've had some we've had some questions about it, and it really is it's not currently allowed in R1 or R2. Um, there are some of these that could be allowed in a duplex zoning if you don't already have two. You maybe you could build one of these. Um, there's just a lot of questions and a lot of studying that needs to be done about it because it does increase the density of whatever neighborhood it gets built in. Um, there are things to consider like. Uh, Airbnbs, VRBO, you know, it, it could be excellent uh, for people to have an additional source of income, but it could also end up being a, a problem for neighbors. So we're trying to figure out as we move forward and look at alternative ideas to get some more affordable housing into Enid, uh, was the, what's the right thing for, for each, for the community? Um, things to consider also would be our current ordinance uh, requires two paved parking spaces per dwelling unit. And these accessory dwelling units, you know, maybe they shouldn't require two parking spaces if they're 650 square foot, you know, designed for maybe one person. So there's a lot of things to consider there. There's a lot of new ordinance coming around. So we're gonna be studying it and bringing, I assume that at some point we may be bringing uh, this back for you all to take a look at and study as well. So. Uh, that's pretty well all I have on that. I just wanted to let you know we were looking at it, uh, but there's a lot to consider. So I think that's it for my presentation, unless there's any more questions. Okay. Scott, thank you very much. Good discussion from the commissioners. Uh, I don't believe there's any action on that. The next item on the agenda is uh, to discuss the membership and makeup of the MAPC. Who's up on that? Well, it's. Yeah, I, can, I, I wrote I can it out. Carol <laughs> I wrote it out so you guys can just read it. Okay. In the background. When you read the background, what it will say is that uh, in the planning commission, when the city adopted MAPC as the planning commission, um, I believe by the law that Carol's written up, the city appoints four people, the county appoints four people. There's one ex officio person appointed from the county and the city and incorporated cities in the MAPC get one appointed person too. So how that adds up, that adds up to 11. If you'll look at that, uh, it's on the very back page of your packet. Mm -hmm. So I think we may be short one right now of a county appointee mm -hmm. perhaps. I think we are. I've got one next month we're going to put on, so that'll fill us back up. Okay. Can, you, can you move it back to the top? Hmm? I can't see the beginning of it to read it. No, I asked the question okay. to put it on the agenda for, because I got the rule book, which you guys got a copy of it now, because yes, I made everybody a copy. And I had questions on how all this works, so... That's why I wanted to bring it forward okay. to see how all this works. It also, as we go down through there, that we can allow other departments or other towns to join this organization. Entities in, in the MAP program, such as Walcomus, North Enid, and some of those. Is that not right? That's what I read, or that's what Tommy told me, RDA. I think what Carol wrote was that they can they can ask to be a part of it. I think that's the very bottom. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think they've done that at this point. Um, See, Wacomus was never asked, as well, far as I know. So. As far as I it's, know, Wacomus has never come forward either, in fairness. So, so. But if we make this aware that they can join, is that something we're allowed to do? Um, that's, that's a good legal question. 
Are um, we asking for inside of Wacoma's proper that this body would make decisions related as the plan, is there a planning commission? That's that's probably the legal the question. The three-mile range goes all the way past downtown Wacoma to Woods Road. So the town is incorporated into the three-mile maps programs. Well, I'm asking, are they, should they be a member of this? They board? could be, but um, they don't have to be. And um, now they could decide they wanted to be in this and they could ask you all to do um, their, to be their planning organization. I don't know if they have one or not, but no one has asked. Well, that's why, like what? Don said though, with these, in it, with, with the housing additions and stuff like that, that they're talking about now, that maybe they'd want to join. And that's what I'm asking if they can go ahead and join our organization, because North Enid's I mean, there's several towns around, and the state law allows it, so that's why I'm asking. It's something that we would probably have to study. Carol would need to look into. Um, Tommy may need to look into as well. Uh, I believe the information that we have on the boundaries and MAPC, I believe they've come from the county. Yeah. It might just be a matter, too, of if you're in another smaller community, if you want to join this organization, you know, then you'd have four county guys and five city guys deciding what zoning is in your organization. You might not like that idea. You might want to have your own, have your own people decide what your zoning is. I think it's very similar to what happened in Oklahoma, <laughs> Oklahoma County because you have all of these communities and they each want to maintain their own identity and their own methodology. I don't think they're excluded but oftentimes it's a function of their having an ability to control their destiny by their local citizens rather than citizens from but the But like this deal set up, it would help like towns of Wacomas and Fairmont that can't afford to do upgrades to their, their program. Can't right. It would save them quite to, a bit of money. I'm sorry, yeah. I couldn't understand you. They can't afford to do upgrades to what? They don't have the resources to write a book like we've got here that, for zoning and all of that. I mean, Okay, but they would need, they would need to have their own zoning. The zoning, one, there'd be a lot of work to add someone because the MAPC, if you look at the boundaries of the MAPC, it doesn't include any other city. What do you mean it doesn't include? It doesn't. Um, you pull up. It does. Just pull it up and show them. It includes the whole town of Wacom. It our our GIS map cuts out that town, it cuts out Covington. Mm -hmm. They're excluded because of what this document says. They're well, and it's not that document as much as state law, actually, because that document is um, uh, Garfield County regulations in the MAPC that are outside incorporated towns. Can you say that one more time a little bit slower for me? <laughs> Okay, the MAPC statutes indicate that um, uh, in Title 19 that the city limits of the incorporated towns are not the, in the county. I got you. Not okay. in okay. there. For instance, you can take a look. You can see North Enid fairly clearly. Yeah. Uh, well, you could until all the street names showed up, you'll see a big gap there in the city and they're going to, they're turning on the, um, yeah, there's the boundary. Oh, wow. <clears throat> so I don't know how far the city limits of Wacomas extend, so you, you, you're probably right that some of it may be in that area, but the <laughs> built up areas. Chief said to talk, he can respond all the way to my fire station which is on Woods Road, because it's in that three-mile city charter that you guys make them use. But it sounds yeah. like there's a defined area of what I'd say Enid MAPC. And to me, it's always been explained three miles mm -hmm. outside and then a certain distance within a, like the state Quarter, highway. State highway. Yes. But it doesn't include, it, it, it includes the city limits 
But it doesn't include any other city or town's limits. But the other towns are excluded, or their, their uh, boundaries are excluded, and we don't have those in there. So the geographic area would not change. The question I see on bullet four there is whether or not a smaller town would want somebody to sit here, and it's really not a function of would they be entitled to the services or not. I see it as kind of a another way to have another county representative on, so to speak, even though they'd be there for the sake of a small town, not on behalf of the county. Does that make sense? I, I do know that, and, and, and some of you weren't here when we did this, but a few years ago there was a gentleman who asked for a zoning or something, and his east fence was Lahoma's West Incorporated City Limit Line. So literally, we were making a decision over Lahoma's fence, essentially. And so, as it is right now, unless for some reason um, the incorporated town, whether it's you know Covington or wherever, Garber, or Lahoma's, no, North Enid, um, as it is now, all of those incorporated limits <clears throat> are excluded. There are little chunks out of the out of the pie there. So we made the decision for that. Lahoma did not, for whatever whatever purpose that that was. And it was there was never any comment about, at least from Lahoma that I remember, that they wanted any any kind of. Representation. representation or had any question or there were no protests at that time and I forgive me I can't remember when that was Marvin was here I think Don might have been here for that but that's been probably five or six years yeah. ago anyway so or longer so it, it just has been the, the functional practice since I've been here is Anything that abuts, if it's once it gets into the incorporated city limits of whatever town or village, then yeah. then they handle their own thing. We have it because we have 30, we have a population that exceeds thirty thousand people. That's a state thing, mm -hmm. and so all these other little towns that have three hundred or three thousand people, they don't need uh, a metropolitan. And I've dealt, I've done business in these other towns. In some cases, I really wish they had an MAPC to 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 talk to. Uh, and guide uh, on some of that, but that's just kind of the the function. I don't know that. Yeah, I don't know that they could get any funds or anything like that. Well, I agree with what uh, Don said, and yeah. and uh, what, what you've also indicated, Clarence. That there's a to the extent there's mutual benefit and there are resources available, they should be shared for the entire economic region. And it's a function of representation is one aspect, but being able to leverage what resources we have, and it's a function of, the city has a finite budget, the city, I don't know how that exactly works, but I do know that Wacomas, back when you were a youngster, <laughs> if, you, if you look at where the Walk first speeding sign for Wacomas appears, they annexed, made state law, they annexed the roadside ditch all the way from Wacomas to uh, within, what, a mile? two miles mm -hmm. of Enid. Mm -hmm. So Wacomas stretched, they didn't want to be annexed by the city to, you guys over there kind of remember that. And it did, uh, it passed muster until someone requires municipal services, I suspect, and it's been there for a long time. Hmm. I'm just asking if, if we want them to join or if we offer it to them or if we don't, it's up to you guys. I mean, that's what my question was. Well, the question that this raises is uh, there have been no other towns that have requested a representative on the MAPC. Um, now, that kind of raises the question, I guess, is what you're saying is if someone comes and asks the MAPC, then we would consider... Uh, listening to them and I'm not sure I see two different issues one is yeah. just a rep being here or not which fine maybe the other issue that I think being kind of kicked around is 
services provided by either us or the city and then kind of forced upon that community and I that's those are two different I know those are two different animals well and I think there's a there is a function where if you had let's say Garber and they said we're going to have our own zoning you know they may not have multiple layers of zoning we have you know what is it co3 c4 for commercial that's five well you get into edmund they have 13 garber has commercial <laughs> and so perhaps if there was a cooperative arrangement and you had a representative from garber maybe maybe it's more of a question like we just we're doing uses by review well let's let's look at a use by review based on their zoning just as we look at the county's zoning, just as we look at Enid's zoning. I'm not for or against, I'm just saying I, I don't necessarily think that automatically the incorporated towns would, would be calling Jason and Scott uh, for, for, to give them assignments that's, that's going to remain on them. Um, no, I agree with I that. I just... that. That if anybody wanted to participate, it would be uh, probably a, a, f a function of again cooperative the the better good so, so like like you talked about with the housing study but I don't of, I don't I don't know how we make the sausage on that either. And, but I read that bullet four is a member appointed by any incorporated city or town within the jurisdiction of the MAPC does that mean every incorporated town is entitled to have a seat is that a voting member or is that an advisory? Or member? are they entitled to have a seat? No. Isn't the MAPC limited to 11 members? I don't. Which supersedes which here? See, it looks like to me if they wanted to be on it, they would have to replace one of us. But bullet four, I no. can read bullet four okay. like we haven't been running with them. Okay. It, they've never asked, and they could have their, their own deal. I would imagine that these elected officials have their own planning commission. Yeah, plus the fact that um, if they are going to have zoning, they have to have the zoning and they have to have a code and it has to be recodified periodically. So um, I'm assuming they would have, I mean, every once in a while a small town will call and ask. I remember Hunter at one point wanted to suddenly have a, a uh, code department. And it turned out that it was just because of, uh, at least at that point, I went to their meeting as a nice gesture. I listened to them. I don't think that they realized how much it was involved in having a code department and the fact that they didn't have a judge and that they only had a part-time clerk. And, but it turned out that it was only a, they had issues during uh, the 4th of July with firecrackers, but they had a volunteer fire department. So I suggested that might be the lesser evil, that maybe the fire chief could talk to the kids. Never heard from them again. But I guess it is a big thing and it can be expensive. Uh, and you gotta, you know, I don't know if they all have, what kind of zoning they have. Uh, they can have their own boards. They can talk to the county. But it, that's true. They can do their own thing in their own place, but bullet four sure looks like we might be missing three or four or five seats. I mean, if Lahoma came to us and said, gee, we would really like to participate as members of and just the, having, the, and the no services required. Area planning commission, then they have the right to request that, I guess. It, According to four, they do. Is that what we're getting at? My, the, my, my, the, my. It's very complicated because the three miles, now, North Enid would be probably the easiest, but the three miles um, and, the, and the other the other, you know, the three miles and then, the and then where mile. the water sources are, those are all key to the city. The, the city that created sit with the county. 
Florida. Now, for North Enid, it doesn't matter because they are circled by us. Anyone else, it's, it's the highways. And... Well, and the one reason why I go back to La Homa is you got 412 yeah, basically yeah. running right through, this, through the right. center of it. Right. So, I mean, maybe Fairmont, maybe yeah. Kremlin, Hillsdale, it's, and Hunter, they're like, no, this doesn't do anything for us. I, I, and I don't know that any of them would want to participate or see a benefit in participating. I think the main question is, if they want to, can they? Yeah. It's very curious because there's the idea that all of these smaller communities, they'd like to have you know, their own authority like to, do to do their thing. thing. Yeah. But if we allow everyone to have a seat at this table, 95% of everything that you all recommend and approve pertains to zoning within the city of Correct. Enid. Mm -hmm. And now we have the exact opposite scenario where, you know, you, we're filled with county and other communities making the decisions for our zoning within the city limits. Uh, I can't imagine... I, I, I'm not a well, lawyer. So well, I would suggest back. Carol's done a great job of, of analyzing this. I've looked at the statute briefly, but there are multiple other communities that exist that are similarly situated to our community, and it may make sense to even have the attorney general give us a, their mm -hmm. view. Now, I maybe, would be, maybe not. I, I, I would be concerned about that. Sometimes, well, I mean, it's best to figure out what we want to do and do it rather than ask one a person with political uh, I, I, uh, I understand but to the speaking but just keep, about the particular person that's there now have there been any decisions by our supreme court on this subject i did i've had no reason to look i just tried to look in my there's a lot of attorney client uh, uh, there's some attorney client uh, i'm sorry there are some attorney general opinions uh and one of the things that's weird about the MAPC statute is that it was actually, um, it was a earlier, it was a federal thing. So the whole MAPC oh. idea was a early federal thing that now we are having to, so, so back in the 60s and 70s, they wanted everybody to get together and every single kind of planning thing was going to be run through with all these fancy Fed requirements. And then it, and, and it did not work. But they kept it for transportation. So then they redid it, and we're dealing with that now because we went over 50,000. So now we have the Metropolitan Area Planning Organization with all of its very involved federal requirements. And this is kind of a leftover deal. There's also county and city zoning. There's <coughs> city zoning. There's all sorts of different kinds. Um, but frankly, Right now, the city is so busy doing what it has to do. It's hard to fathom, as we are just starting with the MPO, suddenly inviting every small town to come to us when... Isn't this document a state statute? It's law? I think we can just start by... I think it's fine to find out from the mayors of other communities if they're interested in being on this board, and I think that's probably the way to, to, to probably go ahead, because right now, uh, I can tell you I've never heard from anybody. Um, but they that doesn't mean there's not. About it. Well, could, could, could be, could be. Um, or perhaps if they choose to have sovereignty over their own situation, I don't know. But just to clarify, too, to make sure there are no services per se, just to be clear, we don't do inspections, we don't do building permits, so we wouldn't be talking about any of that. I just want to be clear if this were to ever come to pass and say, well, Comus wanted to be part of this board. We have one community development employee. I think, I think one of the functions of MAPC, of course, and I think we're all aware of this, is we make recommendations for and against things, and those go to the city mm -hmm. or the county commissioner or the county commissioner, or the county commissioner depending on the situation. Um, 
I think if you had other municipalities involved in that, you'd see the same thing. So let's say North Enid or Lahoma or Garber or whatever. Okay, we've, we've reviewed this. We make a recommendation for or against. It goes back to their city council or town council or whatever their governing bodies is. We're not... If they chose, writing rule. If they, if, if they, they chose, if they for some reason yeah. asked to to join, and, and wanted it to be the planning organization, right. it gets even stranger if they have their own planning organization, but they want to be part of this one. Most of them are probably not going to have any planning organizations, um, but they would have to if they want something like that because they're all under thirty thousand people. They're going to have to hire their own people. We're not going to have Leroy handling everything for every town. It would be quite something to consider if our planning, if our community development department had to not only have an expert level knowledge at our ordinances, but also needed to know the zoning of other people so that when they went through the process to bring it to you, if it was funneled through our department and now we've got three or four other towns we have to know their zoning on, that there's all kinds of challenges that that would present. Yes. I think NOTA takes care of most of that for the small towns. It's just, we got to ask about this part of it, so. Right, but who, who prepares the documents, who prepares all of the information and goes through the steps to make sure that 300 foot notices are set up and puts agenda items on the table. It's all our staff that does that. So most of the small towns have legal <coughs> anyway, so good. So there are a okay. lot of good questions. I've got one that's probably gonna seem silly after all of that, because I've just been sitting here doing basic math. So I get how we get to ten with four and four and then the two ex officios, but how did we get to eleven? A member appointed by any incorporated city or town within the jurisdiction of the MAPC. So like Enid gets an extra one because of that? Or, yes. uh, okay, okay. Yes. All right. Then the only other thing I would add, is there a set number? Is that number 11? It, it's not a set number. It's just the way it is right now. That's right. Good enough. All right. Uh, with that being said, I do have one person that wanted to speak on this item. Uh, Melanie Clinton? Nian. 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 Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't have my glasses on. <laughs> You're fine. I understand right. that completely. I'll give you a few minutes if you would. Do, excuse me? I'll give you a few minutes. Okay, thank you. Yes, and the questions that y'all are asking, I would suggest that you look up uh, State Title 19. It's State Title 19, 866.1 through 35 is what outlines the MAPC and the makeup of the MAPC. And um, the City of Enid and Garfield County joined into the MAPC in 1963, which was a long time ago which is why probably most of the smaller municipalities in Garfield County don't know about it or don't know that they have a seat at the table. Um, but what 19.866.7 uh, says, the commission shall consist of the following members, four members appointed by the mayor and the council, four members appointed by the county commissioners, and I'm paraphrasing because you have this in front of you. Um, which shall not be residents of an incorporated city, semicolon, and, so the city of Enid's supposed to have five members, the county commissioners are supposed to have five, or the county's supposed to have five, semicolon, and, which means in addition to those 10 members, one member appointed by each incorporated city or town within the jurisdiction of the commission, which means you're not allowing them to join. You have a state statute that says they have a seat at the table. So it's not up to this commission to allow them to join. The state law states that they have a seat at the table if they want one. Now, what else it says is um, that 
The provisions of this section shall not be construed to prohibit a municipality in a metropolitan area planning commission from creating its own separate planning commission to act within the boundary of the municipality. So if Wacomas already has a, a code, you know, people and they have their own zoning, this is not going to take over Wacomas's zoning. This is only within the jurisdiction of the MAPC, which is the city limits of Enid and three miles and one quarter mile from each state or federal highway. So I would bet to say that the city of Covington really wished that they had somebody on this board when this board approved a solar farm right outside the city limits and next to where people live. Now, it's because you're sitting here saying, well, why would somebody else want to be on this board? Well, the city of Covington didn't have a voice on this board when this body in 2017 approved a solar farm right outside of the city limits. I bet now they wish that they did. I bet the residents of Covington wish that they did. So yes, in and incorporated, now they have to be incorporated, an incorporated jurisdiction within the three mile zone of the of Enid or one quarter mile of a state or federal highway has a seat at this table and then they would have a voice if this body had something that was going in next to their town. So that's so I, I encourage you to read this whole thing. It's it's spelled out in plain English and I've read over it and over it and over it and um, this is what defines what the Metropolitan Area Planning Commission can and can't do. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I'll add a little bit to that. I live in uh, Covington. You'll, you'll need to. Um, is your name on the list? No, sir. I'm sorry. Okay. I told him that. Right now, I've got to. I, I would just to add. Yes, sir. While Covington wasn't on this board, the Garfield County was on this board when that decision was made. So, FYI. Thank you, sir. Yes, Smith. Well, these are 4 3. Okay. All right. The last item on the agenda is consider amending, which is, we could kind of consider this all together, but it says uh, consider amending or revising the 1963 Garfield County zoning regulations. Now, we pretty much discussed all of this. Uh, is there anything? Scott, that you can add to that for the, uh, or, or Carol? Uh, I, I think Commissioner Maley is the one that asked for this to be on yeah. there. I don't think we I have anything to, to add. Tommy Humphreys, our new DA. It is our job as the board to bring this book up to date. Okay. He says it's our job as the board. So we need to get started on updating it to cover solar farms, windmills, the only thing I would say is the only thing I would say is that yes, I the MAPC should review and approve the changes and then send it to the county. Tommy um, said he would help write the new but, program. Okay, what I was going to say is it when I want when I bring some. When there are changes that need to be made to our zoning, I bring it to you all, but I at least give you a copy of something I think would work, and then you guys can shoot holes in it, or say you don't like it, or tell me to go back, but we don't usually say, well, we need this, and then we just all together kind of hash it out verbally at a meeting. So I guess what I'm saying is somebody needs to take a stab at it, and if, if Tommy's going to do it, great. I think that would be more be, helpful than us. It needs to be a public us. hearing, study session, follow up with markup from everyone that has an interest to yeah. go through the process. But we and need to get started gonna... on it so we don't wind up where we're at now. Can, can I, like, what, what's the, the driver behind this? Because I feel like there's there's something going on here as to where this conversation's coming from. The solar from. farm is one of the biggest issues. I get calls every day on the thing. Okay. About how to shut it down, how to make it go, I don't know. It's just, 
There's a lot of people against it, and they live in my district, so I hear from them every day. They're all right. Part of them sitting out there. Do and you? we need to fix the problem. I mean, we need to have regulations and stuff, and Tommy said he'd be willing to help us rewrite because he's written them for somewhere around Bartlesville, whatever county that was. He re helped write the new version. And we just need to get started and bring it in here and hash it out and go forward from there as far as I'm concerned. David, to piggyback on a comment you made where something was drafted by someone and then public hearing and then study session, study session meaning this board to go in and study. And maybe I, the county commissioners. I think it's at all. Anyone that has input, you, you can end up uh, studying it to death, so it should Came up with a plan. I, I just I said that just in the context of normal legislative process. But mm -hmm. um, as far as the mechanics of this particular document, I I, I haven't read it. Well, it, I haven't read it either. I just I just got here an hour and four minutes ago. But being the newest member on this board, I I wouldn't feel comfortable no, I, having input on it unless it was thoroughly discussed. Like you said, with with all parties that were uh, potential uh, had an applicable interest in it, correct. Whether that be this board plus the commission or, or whatever. <clears throat> this was adopted 60 years ago. Every individual on there is has passed from this life, so uh, can't it's, it's not been modified or revisited since. Well, it must have been working pretty well up till now. That's right. That's <laughs> where I was going. <laughs> and, so the point, I guess my next question, but if there's a specific use in that, wouldn't it, I, and Carol, correct me if I'm wrong, but wouldn't it be something as, I say simple, it's probably not the right word, but to have an ordinance drafted as an amendment to this presented, and then we would vote on that and send it to the county commissioners instead of, because I mean, that's, that's really vague language about amending and revising that instead of adopting whatever, I, I don't know if it's in regards to a solar farm or whatever else, that ordinance would be. I mean, it could be something, you know, that has nothing to do with a solar farm, but it would just be an amendment to that what we would review and recommend for its adoption on a normal basis. I mean, am I, am I saying that correctly? I think so. This body functions for the county as well as the municipality. So consequently, it seems to me our legal, Enid legal and county legal need to collaborate in order to come up with a plan here. Uh, because that's essentially who it will be serving as we move forward. What he said. Yeah. Well, and, and, and when we worked on the sidewalk ordinance and the sign ordinance, there were, uh, I know on the sidewalk ordinance myself, Jonathan Waddell, mm -hmm. uh, Mayor Mason when he was still Commissioner Whitney Hall, um, we actually sat down with community development and went back and forth on some ideas uh, because that ordinance was uh, 1983 or 85 and there were some changes there so perhaps it's a matter of targeting looking in here and targeting some things that need to be modernized just like we're talking now about we, ha we, we weren't dealing with tiny houses and accessory dwelling units only the rich folk had had guest homes and pool houses back 10, 20, 30 years ago. Now we're updating it. The old ramshackle mobile homes that my buddies used to rent, they're all gone. And now these houses are, uh, the new modern manufactured home is very nice and built to a very different standard. So I think there's some things perhaps that we target, you know, page 12 instead of page 90 or pages 15 through 100, maybe we target some things that should be um, modernized, Modern. I guess. And, 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 and this was a joint all, effort, as you can see. Yeah. This was a joint and effort of the city and the county, and so consequently that would be the way it would be addressed as far as the mechanics. I know we like short meetings, but at some point I think we all need to probably look at this and kind of thumb through it and go, you know, wow, that just seems... That seems kind of old fashioned. That definitely was something that was written in the 1960s. There's and maybe we all can come up with some ideas. Well, I would suggest let's not 
reinvent the wheel. If we have exactly. other MAPCs that have already updated, it would be a good place to give consideration. I think, and I think there's... fit our community and our locality and our geographic area and our needs. I th and I think you'll find that, that probably 75% of this is probably still consistent. Um, and I just opened a page here and it's talking about churches and and playgrounds and public schools. I don't know that there's been a lot of of dramatic changes in, in municipality use over a period of time. So I think we just need to kind of, if you want to participate, I think we just need to kind of look this over and maybe send Clarence or somebody a suggestion and say, here's what the attorneys can hash out because I don't want to write rules. I'm just a guy, I'm not an attorney. I'm not either, I just ask questions. <laughs> Thank you, Clarence. People ask Hi. me, and I, uh, I mean, guys, <laughs> I, I am proud of uh, the fact that uh, I've seen some board meetings uh, on TV that got way out of hand with uh, a lot of uh, discussion, and I think we're doing quite well. Uh, we spent a lot of time here. I think we've all gotten an idea. I am sorry. I have two other people if, that uh, have put their name on the list. And they do have, uh, they want to address the two items that we are talking about. I, if you've got something to add. Um, I signed up for this one also. You, pardon? I signed up for this um, agenda item also. Okay. And your name is? Leanne. Yeah. Okay. Well, so who, I thought we just had. Come up. She signed up for four. Two. Oh, okay. So you want to talk about both of them? Yeah. Sure. Well, she's already, she's already talked about the one. No, I think we're I'm on, on 4.3. So I can answer some of the questions that y'all are asking about this particular subject also. I don't know if you guys have a copy of the zoning regulations that were passed in 1963. Uh, yes, is, do you did. have it in front of you? Okay. If you look at page six, this will explain to you what you're talking about. So the purpose and necessity of the MAPC, the regulations contained herein are necessary to encourage the most appropriate uses of land, to maintain and stabilize the value of property, to reduce fire hazards and improve public safety and safeguard the public health, that's section two. Um, in interpreting and applying the provisions of these regulations, they shall be held to be necessary for the promotion of the public health, safety, comfort, convenience, and general welfare. And then if you look at section three, it specifically states that these regulations classify and regulate the use of land, buildings, and structures within the unincorporated areas of Garfield County, Oklahoma. And they shall apply to those areas within three miles of the city of Enid, and within one quarter mile of any state or federal highway in the county, excluding any incorporated area which the board and county commissioners assumes jurisdiction as indicated by the zoning maps. So what you're talking about being rewritten are these regulations, not the code for inside Enid city limits. These are the regulations for the unincorporated area and this is what needs to be reviewed because it's been 60 years and a lot has happened in 60 years. Lots of things have been invented, lots of things have been outlawed, um, you know, things have been made legal that used to be outlawed. There's lots of things that need to be changed, but these regulations are specific to the county and not inside any incorporated area. And so those are the regulations that need to be And updated. only within the MAPC jurisdiction. That's, that within would be my question. Is that three miles I don't, of I don't hear it as all of Garfield County. No. In the jurisdiction, which is three miles right. from, the, from the city the limits of Enid right. to three miles um, we're the and same thing. one quarter mile from each state or federal highway. Right. That so is the jurisdiction, yes. Three miles east of Garber doesn't count. I mean, no. it's two That's miles right. south of Garber, other than by next to the highway. Unless There's Garber a lot of area out join. there that just does not apply. Kind of like the... We have no code enforcement outside of this. Right. Yeah. And I don't know that... 
So then we would have to ask the question if Garber does decide to join, is it three miles from the Garber? So that we would have to ask no. that question of. No. Um, I don't think that it is. Uh, because right. it talks we could get, about. Yeah, get clarification no. on it, that for it, sure. Um, Breckenridge is the only one east that qualifies. Which one? Breckenridge. Breckenridge. East. What well, Covington, Wacomas, North Enid. Okay. Covington is incorporated. Yeah, I don't think we're. I, tonight, I've not ever heard this idea of changing the boundaries. No, no, I'm not saying you change the boundaries. The, boundaries. the state law is, yeah. sets the boundaries. It's, it's close to the highways, and then it's three right. miles around the city that went in with yes. Garfield County. Right. Now, Which is supposed to have five members on the board. See, Lahoma doesn't even qualify for the three miles. Lahoma. Well, it's because it drops off the state limits, highway. Correct. If it's within a quarter mile of a state highway, it would. Yeah, pieces of yes. it would. Which yes. is which was which is Except why, that the why pieces example that are I brought up, the it's right there on the yes. fence and Highway 412. And it's, Covington, it's on the, on the remember, they approved that whole solar complex out in Covington, but it's outside the three mile What's, zone. But it's on 74. Yes, miles. but it's a quarter mile off of 74, so that's why. Yeah, so this wouldn't change the this wouldn't change the zoning inside the city of Enon. But I would assume that the the code inside the city of Enid is more updated than 60 years ago. So they might not need to be as updated as these so, guys. So you're did. suggesting that this should probably start with the county, I think is what she's suggesting because Yeah, the county commissioners the, do the it. The MAPC area is in the county. Yes. We're good. Tommy started on it. We'll work with it. We can bring it back to here and go from there. Okay. But it certainly start. doesn't preclude any of us if you want to yeah. look at it. Yeah, if you've you got, got an idea. I, I think you've got a point well taken. Yeah. And again, yeah. we're yeah. we're not against open uh, this thing up to study. Uh, whether or not anything would need to be changed, uh, let us take a look at it. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Okay, I have a Leah Smith. I'll go ahead and pass. Okay, thank you. And a Suzanne Hunter. Okay. With Chairman, that being, yes, sir. Chairman, I just wanted to say, since this uh, meeting's recorded, that if anyone is interested in looking at this document, you can go to cityvena.org. And if you look at on our community development page, there's a section in our website where it shows all of our comprehensive plans and studies. And this document that I printed out for each of you, anyone can look at online. It, and it's called the Garfield County Zoning Regulations. So if anyone wants to go out on the website, they're welcome. I just figured we may be studying it long enough that it was worth a paper copy, so I, that's why I printed you each. Very good. Copy. Thank you. Appreciate it. Again, thank you all very much for uh, uh, this discussion we've had. Last item on the agenda is I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion Second. to adjourn. Second. Motion to second to adjourn. All those in favor, aye. Aye. Those opposed, we are adjourned. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Stuck.